scripture reading is the uh, prepared passage for today, so Psalm chapter 19. We'll read this in its entirety. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the, all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So rather fitting on this day that we talk about a, a passage here that, that talks about the sun and the psalmist observes the sun uh, going from sunrise to sunset essentially, finding its circuit across the sky. And Well, the sun is kind of hard to see today, but that's okay. We rejoice in its warmth all the same. Today we look at Psalm 19, uh, and some of this is shaped also by the book of Ephesians. I'm not going to cite specific verses, but there are concepts there that if you're familiar with the book, you'll, you'll hear them, and you can uh, take a look at it some other time, I suppose. But again, Psalm 19 with hints of Ephesians. So I asked my Facebook friends this past week about some everyday rules that are part of their lives. I'd like to share some of the less idiomatic responses. One of those is a very practical, don't text and drive. Now that started off as just a suggestion, but it became a rule in many places. Another one, don't talk with your mouth full. The loophole for that, of course, is to talk with your mouth half full. <laughs> so you can continue on your, your talking. Another one that's related, this was advice from a pastor to his sons in the midst of their congregation at a potluck. Boys, don't eat like pigs. It needs to be said sometimes. Others, make your bed, put the seat down. Presumably that is a toilet seat. Uh, don't eat the yellow snow. Very helpful to know this. Also, uh, don't bite your friends. Sounds pretty easy to fi figure that one out, but a mom had to tell her son exactly those words. Another one that saw, that had a few responses very much like, very similar, uh, make sure you have clean underwear on, and then some people added, in case you're in an accident. Practical advice. And finally, make good choices. Some of these are rules that come into our everyday lives. And I'm sure that you've got other practical rules that you were taught or that you abide by uh, very regularly. You grew up with certain rules. And some families had more, more rules than others. And if you were part of that family as the kid, or even as the adult, then your household was considered strict. And then we put on the face, like, oh, your parents are strict, maybe even oppressive. And then there were some families with fewer rules that were considered lazy or uncaring. And it was kind of hard to find that mix in between the two we might call extremes. But regardless of how your home was, or perhaps still is, when you went to school, 
played sports or started driving, you encountered other sorts of rules to guide or restrict you in your day-to-day -day life. Maybe you encountered math, for example. So I ask you, what is three plus two? You can just answer that for yourselves. That's fine. You know that the answer there, or hopefully you know the answer there is five. A little bit upgraded math question here. What is the square root of 144? You might know that the answer is 12. Finally, what is the hypotenuse of a right triangle with legs of 5 and 12? You might know that answer as well. It is 13. And in most of our worlds, whether you agree or knew the answer or not, there, you can agree that there is a right answer to these questions. Math conventions help solve them, and we abide by them. Many of you are familiar with PEMDAS, which tells us the order of operations when solving a math problem. And when it comes to math, although this is more math than you ever wanted to hear about in a sermon, having a standard is really helpful. Grammar and spelling have rules too, though perhaps not as rigid. The rules help us to know what is right, and also, consequently, what things are not right. The psalm we're looking at today is kind of a corollary for life based on the psalmist's subjective view of God's orderly creation, meaning that he sees what's going on in the heavens. And maybe you find yourselves looking up from time to time, too. Yesterday, the, the stars were out, and or two nights ago, the stars were out. Very beautiful. Uh, we were here in the parking lot for a drive-in movie, but you can still look up and see the beauty in the heavens. So the psalmist looks up and sees what's going on in the heavens, the sky, and to him, the sun's regular, consistent trajectory reveals a purposeful creator. Likewise, we have purpose as God's earthly, and since I'm speaking to you, specifically human creations. And we are governed by the rules that God has established both the laws of nature and also the law of Moses. The laws are in place, even if we don't subscribe to them, although we do run into problems when we think that those laws don't apply to us or when we simply ignore them. We are a people of rules, and our God is an orderly, purposeful, intentional, logical God whose laws and orders are as the psalm describes, they are, they are perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, enduring, true, and righteous. That's the way he describes it. I mean, I'm not very romantic, but I'm, I mean, my wife would argue with me because she, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not very romantic, but I'm pretty sure that those words could be part of a love poem. Come on, ladies. You wouldn't swoon if your husband's leaned in and called you pure, clean, and righteous? No? Well, we may not speak this way today, but the psalmist is absolutely head over heels for the righteousness of God. And these lovey-dovey words are describing the very laws of the Lord. When we look at this psalm in its entirety, we see how backward we are about things. We love to be right. At least I do. And I know some of you, and you are likewise. <laughs> we love to be right, but the commandments of God remind us that it is truly right to love. And I'm going to repeat that because that's kind of a nugget that you can take with you today. We love to be right, but the commandments of God remind us that it is truly right to love. So when we say that God is righteous, we're not saying he's only a justice-seeking, rule-keeping, you-better-do-everything-right God. We're saying that his ways are perfectly beautiful and so loving that we should spend some time wondering why we, or anyone else for that matter, would ever want to do anything besides follow them. They are that beautiful. They are that good for us. Psalm 19, verse 10, to pull out one of the familiar portions of this psalm, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. 
God's laws are sweet. And maybe there are sweeter things in your imagination or in your taste buds than, uh, than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. But right now, I'm getting hungry for honeycomb. That is what I want right now. But this purest and sweetest form of honey was right from the comb, right from the source, unprocessed, unrefined. And the law of God is even sweeter than that. The law is thought of as pleasing and practical. It even directs us to see where we've messed up in our relationships with God and other humans. And as wonderful as that all is, the psalmist recognizes that there are some things left beyond our understanding or awareness. So paraphrasing verses 12 through 14, this is the psalmist prayer, psalmist prayer. Lord, we aren't discerning of our errors. We don't always know when we do wrong. Even in our hidden faults or unknown sins, we ask that you declare us innocent anyway. And everything that I say, do, and think, even the desires of my heart, may they be acceptable to you, O Lord. Just as the psalmist obviously consulted his thesaurus, for verses 7 through 9 and all the there's the sun and all the laws rules and commandments of the Lord he does it again in verses 12 and 13 with errors faults presumptuous otherwise known as arrogant sins and great transgressions and in case we think we can call them by a different name to get out of it or plead ignorance he gives us he throws the book at us he gives us all these different names for it for our sin. We cannot plead ignorance. We cannot just call it something else to get out of it. Still, we still are guilty. Except that these are God's laws and we live in God's courtroom. Now, God will not tell you to, to not follow the laws. He won't tell you that they don't apply. And it's not because he's just Kind of on the sly and turning a blind eye. He can pardon if he wishes to do so, and he very much wishes to do so. A righteous God doesn't just do away with laws. A righteous God doesn't brush away consequence, but a righteous God, especially a righteous and loving God, puts a system in place that doesn't end with wiping out everyone who is or has ever been wrong. God's system ends up declaring people right or righteous like he is. Because the system doesn't just end with the law and the punishment for wrongdoings. In faith, we cry out to God for mercy, even in the midst of our wrong. We cry out to mercy and by grace we are saved. We are pardoned and set free through faith in Jesus Christ. What God gives us as a gift isn't a blind eye and just letting us do our own thing over here while he looks the opposite direction. He doesn't ignore his own laws. He gives us the life of his righteous son in exchange for our own. One thing that we enjoy in English, or that we can enjoy in English at least, that doesn't exist in Hebrew in this particular text is the wordplay with the word son, S-O-N, and the son, S-U-N. In English, we look up to see the S-U-N. We follow the plan set out for it, much like the psalmist did, from rising to setting. And it's compared to a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and there is nothing hidden from its sunness, the, the, the characteristic that it is, so it's heat and it's light. We also look to and worship the S-O-N of God, who was obedient to the plan set for him as well, from his birth to death on the cross and to his going to prepare a place for us. He is a bridegroom preparing a home for his bride, his people, the church, and there is nothing hidden from his righteous love. May we today enjoy God's creation as the psalmist did. We enjoy our Father's world and everything in it, and through it, see that God continues to care for his creation by his righteous laws. May we also enjoy God's incarnation 
the Word made flesh, and all that He came to do, and through it, see that God continues to love. And finally, may we rejoice in the sweetness of the Spirit, through whom the mysterious righteousness of God is revealed. In the name and the Spirit of Jesus, Amen.